Professor Holland will be introduced by Mary Holland McCann, and uh, then we'll hear from Professor Holland. The his title tonight, Latter-day Saints and the Problem of Pain. Uh, the, uh, his lecture will be recorded tonight, available on our Ma uh, Maxwell Institute website eventually, so for those who weren't able to be here who might be interested, you can direct them there. At the conclusion of Professor Holland's lecture, uh, a benediction will be given by Rosalind Welch, a member of our advisory board at the Institute. After that closing prayer, we invite you to join with us out in the atrium of the Tanner Building here for some light refreshments and a reception. Uh, we won't have a Q&A session here for the lecture, but Professor Holland has agreed to stay for as many hours as you'd like to discuss. <laughs> Without further ado, Mary, thank you. I am more than honored to introduce to you tonight one of the people I admire most in this world. He also happens to be my baby brother. Now, considering that one of my strongest adolescent memories is of my parents returning home from his parent-teacher conferences in middle school, tearing their hair out, <laughs> trying to convince him that school is more important than football. It's with just a little bit of awe that I'm about to read you this professional biography. <laughs> and a lot of admiration. David Frank Holland is the John A. Bartlett Professor of New England Church History at Harvard Divinity School and a faculty member of Religion and, Re and American Studies at Harvard University. Prior to his appointment at Harvard, David received a bachelor's degree, summa cum laude, with university honors from Brigham Young University in 1998, and was the valedictory speaker at commencement exercises that year. At this time, he also received an Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship for the Study of Humanities, which helped fund his graduate program in history at Stanford University. He earned his master's degree in history at Stanford in 2000, and his PhD in 2005. He also served as an associate professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas from 2003 to 2004. David's first book, Sacred Borders, Continuing Revelation and Canonical Restraint in Early America, was published by Oxford University Press in 2011. He is currently at work on a textbook of American intellectual history, We Hold These Truths, Ideas and Ideals in the American Past, commissioned by Oxford University Press, and a comparative biography, A Particular Universe, Ellen Gould White, Mary Baker Eddy, and the 19th Century United States, to be published by Yale University Press. His scholarly essays, which are many, have appeared in a host of publications, including the distinguished New England Quarterly. David's first professional commitment, however, is to the students in his classroom where he teaches a variety of courses, including, and to only name a few, the story of American religious freedom, women's religious leadership in American history, and the character of God in early America. In 2011, during his faculty years at UNLV, David's teaching was recognized with the Nevada Professor of the Year Award, sponsored by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. David currently serves as a president of the Nashua, New Hampshire Stake, and is married to the former Jeannie Hansen. They are the parents of four children, Hansen, Bethany, Peter, and Rachel. And Hansen is currently serving a mission in the Brazil Curitiba mission. All right, now that the boring stuff is out of the way, <laughs> let's get to the real David Holland, sort of the uncut sister version. <laughs> David is affectionately known to all of us who love him as Duff. This is partly because he was nicknamed after my father's beloved mission president, Marion Duff Hanks, partly because there were a lot of Davids on our street when he was born, and partly because it fit his personality very early on. <laughs> Out of the three of us Holland children, he was always the most full of passion, spirit, and spunk. Even as a child, he combined that passion with a conviction for defending the truth, despite any contradiction. And as children and as a sibling next to him, I was usually the source of that contradiction. One of Duff's early triumphs happened one day as we walked across campus. When my dad was called to serve as the president of the university in 1980, um, Duffy was in first grade and I was in sixth. We lived in the old president's home and attended school at Wasatch Elementary on 9th East. So we would walk across campus together to and from school every day. 
Duff was the pride and joy of every student on this campus. Um, and usually he would walk confidently ahead of me with a wad of curly hair, an affable smile, and a friendly shout of howdy to any student passing by. <laughs> this greatly offended my sensitivities as an awkward 12-year-old. <laughs> so I told him to stop. He argued with me that the students loved it, and I argued with him that it was stupid and told him to stop, <laughs> in a way only a bossy big sister can. So to the next student who walked by, he obediently and calmly said, hello, to which the student responded with a boisterous, howdy. <laughs> he turned around and looked at me with a triumphant smile, and I knew that day and from then forward that one of us would always be more confident in the right than the other. The only time I saw his resolve waver was one Sabbath day when we wanted a treat and couldn't find anything in the cupboards that suited us. We knew from previous explorations that the Mazer building was unlocked on Sunday and that it had vending machines. So we tentatively and cautiously approached my dad and asked if it would be breaking the law of the Sabbath if we went to get candy from the machines. We justified our request by explaining we weren't really making anyone work, so we saw no conflict with the Sabbath day observance. My dad lowered the paper he was reading, lifted his eyes and said, well, I guess that depends if you're trying to live the letter of the law or the spirit of the law. For maybe the first and last time in his life, Duff was stymied, mm -hmm. as was I. Neither of us were sure if it were the letter of the law or the spirit of the law that would <laughs> allow us to get the candy. <laughs> So we looked at each other, talked for a minute, and finally decided we would be valiantly obeying the scriptural injunction to find joy in the Sabbath day if we had the candy. So we went. <laughs> Besides being smart, funny, and engaging, Duff has always been kind, generous, and loyal. For example, at about age four, he allowed my brother Matt and I to leave him in the closet for hours while we played with older friends. <laughs> We would slip graham crackers and gum under the door <laughs> occasionally to keep him happy and to ease our conscience. And we always heard a heartfelt, thanks guys, from the other side of the door. <laughs> At about the same age, he willingly and always took the heat from the rest of us for doorbell ditching because he couldn't run as fast as we could and he'd always get caught. However, he had so much charisma and charm that he could charm any angry neighbor out of getting all of us in trouble, so we always brought him along. And even as an adolescent himself, he would willingly get out of bed any night, very late, and go with his teenage sister, distraught over the latest high school fiasco, to ride to the Crest Station south of campus and get a big pink cookie. All of these attributes and many more have combined to make Duff into the remarkable person he is today. His academic and professional accomplishments speak for themselves. But in conclusion, I wanted to share a few of the accomplishments of his from those who know him best, his family. His wife, Jeannie, says if there were one thing she wishes the academic world knew about Duff, it would be that his success lies in always putting the Lord first and letting everything else fall into place including accepting the call to serve as stake president when he was trying to make tenure at Harvard. One of his children says his greatest skill has nothing to do with teaching Harvard kids. It's making a great puff pancake every weekend. The others say he's the best at playing games, at making everyone laugh, and helping with homework even late at night. And what does he teach? A lot more than history. According to his children, he teaches them to always be kind, to work hard, to be polite, and how to cope with difficult situations. He's always taught them that they are his first priority. They say he never gets mad, never makes them feel pressure, and is a really good listener. Therein lies the mark of a good teacher, be it a professor, a stake president, a father, or a little brother. It will now be our privilege to hear from him. Many virtues do not include honesty. Um, <laughs> she
see is a paragon of patience and forbearance, always allowing an annoying little brother to join her at whatever she did with whomever she was doing it, and is a hero of mine. I'm profoundly humbled by the invitation to participate in this evening's celebrations. I'm grateful to Spencer Fluman for including me and for so many others who not only do the hard work to pull an anniversary, an anniversary event like this together, but who do the daily heavy lifting necessary to make the Maxwell Institute a place worth celebrating. So many noble hearts and so many brilliant minds have given the very best of themselves over these years to provide us with, with a place where light and truth can be relentlessly pursued in a spirit of shared affection. If nothing else comes through in my remarks this evening, I hope that my reverence for this institution, my gratitude for all that it has been in its various iterations, and my confidence in all that it yet promises to be will be unmistakable to you. It's in good hands. Professor Fluman and I met each other some 19 years ago, this fall, as a matter of fact, as undergraduate classmates in a German language course that convened not far from here. That seems not so long ago to me. Kurt Vonnegut, Kurt Vonnegut once famously wrote that true terror is to wake up one morning and discover that your high school class is running the country. <laughs> I'm inclined to agree, though this year my high school class might not be a bad option. <laughs> True sanguinity is to wake up and realize that the Maxwell Institute is being directed by a person that I have loved and admired for over two decades. I'm appreciative of Spencer's leadership. While the substance of what the Maxwell Institute does is sacred by its very nature, there can be no question that for many of us, let's see if I can get the technology to work here. <laughs> But for many of us, um, its mission and its uh, purpose was heightened and hallowed when it took the name of Elder Neil A. Maxwell. That is a name that I grew up hearing invoked in tones of admiration and love, and I don't think it's too hyperbolic to say reverence, before I fully could understand why. It was uttered with affection throughout the global church, to be sure, but I, what I remember most vividly is how it was spoken in the walls of my own home, where Elder Maxwell was continually referenced as an exemplar of true charity and courageous discipleship. If there's one word that is associated in my mind with Elder Maxwell more than any other, it is discipleship. For a family of teachers, he served as the premier model of what it really means to teach. His memory continues to be reverenced in our hearts and in our homes. This evening is rendered all the sweeter and the more humbling for me by virtue of the fact that members of the Maxwell family are here with us in attendance. Of all the many valued lessons that Elder and Sister Maxwell taught to my parents that were then conferred upon us, the one that has most poignantly remained with me relates directly to my theme for this evening. When my father was a very young man, tasked with some weighty responsibilities, he had the inestimable blessing of being mentored by Elder Maxwell, basically out of the purity and generosity of Elder Maxwell's heart. On one occasion, prior to a significant address my dad had been asked to deliver, he asked Elder Maxwell to read a draft of the talk. After reviewing the draft, he offered some words of encouragement and then a kindly warning, I paraphrase. Jeff, he said, there's one place in the talk where you have been insufficiently careful of the pain in people's lives. There are scars that go unnoticed, but you must see them. You must tread with caution on the hallowed ground of another's suffering. My dad, arrested by the solemnity and the feeling with which that counsel was offered, looked into Elder Maxwell's face and saw great stores of compassion, won by a disciple's compound of personal experience and divine grace. 
Since that story was repeated to me numerous times as a child, usually accompanied by my dad's own emotion at the recollection of it, I can testify to the impact it had on one man's heart and on that of his son. The principles of ministry that Elder Maxwell offered in that moment of personal counsel were echoed in the doctrines that he taught from the pulpit. But it was not only in our need to handle each other's suffering with care that Elder Maxwell addressed the problem of pain. He had, after all, a marked capacity to recognize multiple facets of complex truths. Citing the example of Jacob in the Book of Mormon, he reminded us repeatedly that sometimes true love requires us to confront sin, a prophetic process that promises long-term healing even if it intensifies short-term pain. And he eloquently recognized pain as an essential element of the discipling process. I still recall the words he offered in the General Conference of April 1991. I was on my mission at the time when the conference tapes were like pure gold. At that time, he memorably asked, when righteously chastised or rebuked, we need not faint, for in the correcting is renewing love. How can you and I really expect to glide naively through life as if to say, Lord, give me experience, but not grief, not sorrow, not pain, not opposition, not betrayal, and certainly not to be forsaken. Keep me, Lord, from all those experiences which made thee what thou art. Then let me come and dwell with thee and fully share thy joy. Elder Maxwell had an uncanny ability to point out with good humor and a high degree of patience the absurdity of our quest for cheap grace. In these teachings of Elder Maxwell, we catch a striking image of the paradox of pain in a Christian life. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, ours, pardon me, <clears throat> Ours is a ministry of healing with a duty to bind the wounds and ease the pain of those who suffer. I believe in President Hinckley's teaching with all of my heart. In a recent stake presidency meeting, as we agonized over the extension of certain calls to serve, we posed the question among ourselves of what faculty we saw as most important for ministering in our Father's kingdom. The answer emerged from our deliberations that we hoped for shepherds who know the healer's art. This emphasis on healing pain can carry the heaviest of implications. Like many of us in this room, my life, both personally and ecclesiastically, has been touched by the tragedy of suicide. This has driven me into an admittedly amateurish research into the sources of suicidal ideation and the findings that I encounter again and again is that those who are driven to these most desperate of thoughts are compelled by a relatively simple imperative. They want the pain to stop. To act for the minimization of pain, both for ourselves and for those whom we love, is our most basic anthropological urge. To allow pain to continue unaddressed and unacknowledged can have the most devastating of implications. Pain then is often couched in the gospel of Jesus Christ as our enemy, to be battled in the name of the Savior who rose with healing in his wings. That, however, is not the whole story. I'm convinced by the sentiment conveyed many years ago by Elder Orson F. Whitney. He declared that no pain that we suffer, no trial that we experience is wasted. It ministers to our education, to the development of such qualities as patience, faith, fortitude, and humility. It is through sorrow and suffering, toil and tribulation that we gain the education that we came here to acquire, close quote. Close quote. Pain, Elder Whitney came close to suggesting in that quotation, is the point of mortality. More recently, President Spencer W. Kimball, a man agonizingly well acquainted with pain, had this to say about the lessons of mortality. Being human, we would expel from our lives physical pain and mental anguish and assure ourselves of continual ease and comfort. But if we were to close the doors upon sorrow and distress, we might be excluding our greatest friends and benefactors. 
Suffering can make saints of people as they learn patience, long-suffering, and self-mastery. Pain, then, has its divine purposes. But as President Hinckley's teaching suggested, to believe in that principle does not resolve the paradox of pain in our life. It merely heightens it. It underscores it. Put simply, we are called upon to minimize in others' lives and even in our own the very force that we're told may be God's most powerful tool for our sanctification. Perhaps no aspect of our lives pulls the disciples' heart in such diametrically opposed directions. This is different, I might add here, than the other areas where we might perceive a tension between human effort and divine will. Since in the battle, say, to hold on to physical life or material wealth or to ensure against catastrophe, these always leave an area beyond our control, an area in which, of necessity, we allow providence to function. Pain, conversely, in our modern anodyne society can always be killed. In New Hampshire, where I spend a good chunk of my life, there is an overwhelming opioid epidemic. In every case I have encountered, pain lies at the root of a terribly self-defeating addiction. However, just as the impulse to flee the darkness of pain can ironically push us into self-destructive paths of pain management, both personally and politically, so a misconceived confidence in the redemptive power of pain can distort and destroy. One can get addicted, it seems, to a certain kind of misery. When I was a young man, indicative of the influence that my older siblings have always had on me, I was introduced by my sister to the writing of Flannery O'Connor. Surely one of the most haunting religiously charged books in all of American letters is Flannery O'Connor's Wise Blood, whose central character, Hazel Motes, grows exhausted with his battle against the frightening demands of faith on one side and the hypocrisies of traditional religion on the other, and instead settles in for a life of escaping this battle by blinding himself with lie, wrapping barbed wire around his chest, and spending his remaining days walking around town with shards of glass that he has stuffed in his shoes. Flannery O'Connor is not for the faint-hearted. It is, as, it is as if Hazel Motes believes a descent into self-inflicted pain, if it is painful enough, absolves him of the difficult task of searching for truth. It does not, he learns in the end. O'Connor's is a harrowing ride, a reminder of how pain can distort even when it's embraced, perhaps especially when it's embraced. And so where does that leave us when we recognize that both the effort to accept the instructive power of pain and the humane impulse to minimize it in our own lives and in the lives of those we love has the capacity to lead us into self-destructive excesses? There are dangers on every side of the paradox. What do we do when in the face of the very pain that has the demonstrable capacity to fracture our communities, to upend our faith, to snuff out the light of promising lives, we hear prophets ancient and modern, as well as the intuitions of our own souls, call upon us to lift that darkness and heal those wounds while simultaneously insisting that pain is an indispensable part of the plan of happiness, perhaps even an unavoidable, unavoidable compliment to love. As I've long noted, Latter-day Saints have been asked by our theology to live at the convergence of competing truths. It's where the disciple spends her most productive hours where grace and work, public community and private home, faith and learning, body and spirit, diligence and rest, justice and mercy seem to tug at us from constantly tense angles, making a mockery at our efforts at easy resolution. It is often the incompatibility of truths that must indeed coexist that drives us to our knees and makes proud human hearts bow before a God in whom all truths find their beginning and their end. Here, as we look through a glass darkly on this planet, we must live with the shearing tensions. With our prophets, we are obliged to declare that pain is a necessary companion to growth and love and even joy, even as we feel a divine charge to prevent it and ameliorate it all around us, including not unnecessarily indulging it in our own lives. There's a cognitive dissonance in this, to be sure, that can only likely be lived with, either by not thinking about it very hard, or by submerging it in the reconciling blood of Jesus Christ. I think God expects the latter. 
And I think he has provided us with the resources to live with and even find purposes in the problem of pain, even if we will never fully solve its riddles in this life. I believe the historical context of the restoration may enable us to see some of these resources more clearly. As I talk a little bit about the philosophical challenge of pain as I meander through these uh, competing concepts, I'm reminded that one of the publications that the Maxwell Institute has recently put out is called The Incoherence of the Philosophers. If there's anything incoherent than a philosopher, it's a historian masquerading as a philosopher. <laughs> I'm not a philosopher, I'm a historian, which means that my head is often stuck somewhere between the Mayflower and Appomattox. <laughs> History is not always the resource for addressing recurring problems that some of us like to think that it is. As the old knock against my profession goes, it's not so much that history keeps repeating itself, but rather that historians keep repeating each other. <laughs> Be that as it may, a historian is what you're stuck with tonight. I'm sorry to subject you to my own backward orientation this evening, but as I contemplate the unruly problem of pain and my own fervent faith in the restored gospel, I find myself thinking about the ways people in the past dealt with these questions of suffering, particularly those whose views were circulating through American culture near the time of the Restoration. It might be worthwhile here to look at just a handful, a quartet, of these historical phenomena and consider how the Restoration spoke and speaks to the questions that they raised. You'll be subjected to a little bit of my professional work here as we work through a few historical episodes, and I apologize if this seems a little excessively detailed, but hopefully the conclusions we draw in the end will be worth the effort. It should be noted at the outset that in highlighting certain theological resources provided by the Restoration, I'm not suggesting that other faiths were utterly bereft of these, far from it. These impulses and resources were widely distributed. I am suggesting, however, that the restored gospel identified or highlighted or underscored or confirmed them in ways that help us in our quest to live with the competing realities of divine love and human pain. It is striking to me that in the decades leading up to the restoration, the question of human pain and its relationship to the divine character were particularly pronounced on the lips of many disputants. Perhaps the first really notable English series of sermons devoted exclusively to the problem of pain came from the famous hymnist Isaac Watts, the same man who gave us joy to the world and also a hymn with the catchy title, When Pain and Anguish Seize My Soul. In his series of sermons on pain, Watts approached his subject with an eye for complexity noting that sometimes pain is so heavy that it serves as a numbing, deadening obstacle to our spiritual well-being. We shrink from it, and in so doing, we shrink from all that would provide its resolution. He also noted that God uses this pain, paradoxically soul-numbing at times, to awaken us from the slumber of self-satisfaction. Pain can reclaim, according to Isaac Watts, as well as alienate. Watts' approach seems rather modern, even as his actual rhetoric seems very much of a piece with his 18th century world. He wrote, Pain is like a rod in the hand of God, wherewith he smites sinners to awaken them into spiritual life. This rod is sometimes so smarting and so severe that it will make a senseless and ungodly wretch look up to the hand that smites him. In Watts's version, a person had to know that the pain came from God in order to have their attention drawn to the majesty and justice of their Lord. This leads me to point number one of the four that I'd like to address tonight, which is that a God with a broader array of, community, of communicative possibilities has a different relationship to pain than the God of the rigidly closed canon. A recurring question in colonial American religious culture in the era after Watts was whether God still communicated with humanity through moments of devastating public pain. That question has never really gone away. Some of you may recall the firestorm of controversy that ensued when Pat Robertson 
and Jerry Falwell began reading divine messages into the events of September 11. This riddle has hung over believers for a long time. For the Puritans, it was officially answered with a Calvinistic no. John Calvin said that it is an act of hubris to try and read too confidently the actions of God in the material world. But in practice, even for Calvin himself, the answer was actually a resounding yes. And such beliefs proved remarkably resilient. Even the cutting edge theological liberals of the mid 18th century, people like Jonathan Mayhew, whose family was famous for establishing Christian churches on Martha's Vineyard, he himself becoming one of the more radical theological reformers of colonial America. But even for Jonathan Mayhew, the colony's most outspoken, most liberal proclaimer of the benevolent goodness of God, declared after the deadly Boston fire of 1760, this evil, the great evil, has not surely come upon us but by his appointment and according to his sovereign pleasure. We may assure ourselves it is not without just and sufficient provocation that he had appeared thus against us. For Mayhew, public pain still beckoned a communal sin, betokened a communal sin, and thus demanded a public reformation. There was a message in the destruction. This was God's public speaking voice in colonial New England. He used pain to get attention, not in spite of his goodness, but out of his current concern for our redemption. By the time we fast forward a couple of decades to the early years of the 19th century, however, the country was supposed largely to have moved past that kind of crass providentialism that read God's chastising hand into every moment of human pain. Historians have noted that in the recurring cholera outbreaks of the early 19th century, ministers seemed less and less willing to put words in God's mouth in reference to the misery that they witnessed around them. That is, except to note that he expects us to minister to the needs of a fallen, broken, and ailing world. In the winter of 1812, for instance, and I'm not going to ask you to read this whole slide. Uh, in the winter of 1812, for instance, a poem began making its rounds through the proliferating newspapers of the early American Republic. Different uh, copyright and plagiarism standards uh, in 1812 than we uh, deal with today. Uh, and it was very common practice to pick things up and, and run them repeatedly in different publications across the New Republic. And it's one of the ways that we identify the influence or impact of a particular piece of writing is how frequently it's rerun uh, in these uh, journals. This one happened to be run again and again from New England to South Carolina. Appearing in journals stretching across the early Republic, the verse had the catchy title, Lines on the folly of ascribing to divine vengeance accidents which result from human indiscretion. <laughs> the poem read in part as follows. In pious mood, Sir Bigot cries, behold a judgment from the skies. See Richmond in despair, and thinkest thou, miserable elf, that God, vindictive as thyself, begins a hell on earth? Mourn if thou canst, but oft forbear to charge on heaven the fatal snare, for heaven delights to save. Ostensibly, the verses were designed to shift causal explanations from God's vengeance to, quote, human indiscretion. The title suggests that the purpose of the poetry was the enthronement of natural causes as the source of human suffering, rather than some kind of anger or vindictiveness from the God of love. Yet the technique it employed to produce that effect was not an explanation of physical science. In fact, we see this recurring in the effort to establish naturalistic explanations of our material world. It is not often an appeal to the epistemological advantages of that particular way of ascertaining truth, but an emotional appeal to the goodness of God, that God simply would not provoke or produce these kinds of painful experiences in the lives of his children. God, this poem simply suggested, would not use this sort of pain as his mechanism of teaching. It was certainly not the first to take up such a strategy in the fight against those who would declare God's mind and will in pain, nor was it alone among its contemporaries. The poem was actually written in response to a dreadful fire uh, that occurred in the Richmond Theater, that is Richmond, Virginia, on a late December night in 1811, and, and which captured the attention of newspaper readers around the country. On an evening just after Christmas, hundreds of, hundreds of Richmond's finest citizens crowded into the theater for a rendition of Denis Diderot's Le Père de Famille, 
one of only two plays penned by Diderot. Le Père had been translated by a Richmond local and was being performed under the title The Father, or Family Feuds, that evening in Richmond. As the curtain lifted before some 600 playgoers, a didactic and sentimental drama unfolded in which the promptings of human feeling, that is, on the stage, were repeatedly pitted against the oppressive demands of a hierarchical society. Within a plot informed by alternating moments of youthful rebellion and familial love, the early national audience saw and heard much that resonated with the new Republican ideals of parenting. While not without his faults, the title character, known simply as the father in the English rendition, appeared as the personification of enlightened paternalism. He expected a modicum of deference from his children and he demanded due obedience when the cause was just, but he did so through love, reason, and suasion, consciously rejecting the heavy-handed patriarchy promoted by his brother-in-law, who represented the ethos of the Ancien Regime. Though his lovelorn son mistakenly accused him and all fathers of being, quote, tyrants, of having given us life only to exercise their authority over it, the father ultimately won at the end of the play, both the love and happiness of his children by resolutely refusing to become, quote, either a harsh and tyrannous father or a vindictive and ungrateful man, close quote. He would not use pain to parent. To a culture inclined to forge connections between ideals of earthly parenting and the nature of their heavenly father, Diderot's play about the benevolent father must have carried important theological implications. Diderot, after all, had been part of the cultural revolution against patriarchy, which preoccupied the Western world during the last half of the 18th century, and in which, as the historian Jay Flegelman has shown, there was a tight correlation between changing parental ideals and evolving conceptions of God. For the Richmond audience viewing the father that night, however, conceptions of divine benevolence and paternalism would face an immediate and awful test. At the conclusion of the featured play, the company began an afterpiece performance of a pantomime entitled The Bleeding Nun, drawn from Matthew Gregory Lewis's supernatural and somewhat salacious novel, The Monk. They were only one scene into the pantomime when the performance came to a sudden halt with shouts of fire, touched off when the house chandelier came into contact with the highly combustible scenery. Flames rapidly spread throughout the closely packed building. Eyewitness accounts detail an ensuing scene of frenzied terror in which some of the most respected members of Richmond society, including the newly elected governor and the president of the Bank of Virginia, were fatally enveloped in a blaze and smoke that was described by one newspaper as black, dense, almost saturated with oily vapors. Perhaps most troubling were the accounts of children, one account of little Nancy Green who perished while trying to find her father in the obscuring haze. The fire remains the deadliest catastrophe in Richmond history. Notably, a church was built on its site after the wreckage of the theater was cleared, a church that still stands today in the heart of Richmond. Before the embers had completely cooled, the theological questions raised by this tragedy, tragedy began rippling out from Eastern Virginia. Could the utter destruction of a playhouse by an angry, be an angry message from God when mere moments before the ignition when mere moments before the ignition, Diderot's godlike title character had convincingly inserted, asserted that an enlightened father simply will not resort to force because it suits my interest. I will not empty my house because it happens that there are things which displease me, close quote. For centuries, the theater had been the object of angry providential memoranda. In Virginia in 1811 and 1812, there were powerful and popular forces pushing against that idea that we can confidently read God's messages in moments of public pain. In the theological cacophony that followed the Richmond fire, we can find just about every conceivable theological response. Certainly there were those who read a divine message into the fire, hearing with the with, within the tragedy the angry voice of the Almighty. And there were those who refused to hear any such thing, appearing in a pair of different newspapers, an ode occasioned by the fire dismissed the interpreters of providence, doing so in the context of positing a pardoning God that's a quote, who was particularly kind, a father from whom even sinners can hope for joy. The ode demonstrated that to put a kind father in control of a cruel, a kind father in control of a cruel fire necessitated an appeal to impenetra impenetrability and an attendant providentialist silence. The poem read, bigots be silent, dare not judge. 
You know the sacred paths of science, how confined by erring mortals trod, nor can you think how happiness and woe are dealt to man by that almighty mind, that all mysterious God. This poem reflects what seems to be an irresistible theological recourse for those looking to preserve divine benevolence in the face of tragedy, an appeal to the inscrutability of God's actions. If Americans were more familiar with the revealed truths of the Bible, one writer complained, they would realize that the Father of mercies always works by the inscrutable designs of his providence and his ways and attributes are unsearchable. Emphasizing God's identity as the Father of love, the universal parent of mankind, another advised mourning family members to silently acquiesce to the divine and omnipotent hand, reverentially and fearfully bowing to that providence whose ways are ever unsearchable. A third challenged the readers of Richmond's Inquirer to behold the mysterious and inscrutable dispensations of his unerring providence, and it is our duty to receive them with a sincere adoration of his infinite goodness and kindness to his children. As these uh, passages suggest, to push the issue of divine benevolence too hard was to risk pushing God's messages right out of life's painful details, something most believers had a hard time accepting. How was it that one was supposed to retain a God who was kind and a God who was involved, present, and meaningful in life's agony? In the theological moves taking place in this era just prior to the age of restoration, in which Americans became increasingly uncomfortable suggesting that God was saying something specific when moments of great pain occurred, many Americans abandoned for the sake of divine goodness what had historically been one of the most reliable sources of divine information. In the past, such moments of pain had served in the office of prophet, warning about certain actions, in particular playgoing, directing certain thoughts, conveying certain messages. In saying that we cannot declare God, that God speaks through such pain, they rendered him all the more silent, rejecting a traditional source of divine direction. Faced with a choice where God could either be cruel or mute, they increasingly chose silence. It was in this context, in this process, that the restoration occurred, bringing with it the declaration that God's voice could, in fact, be heard again, not in catastrophe, not in moments of immense public pain, but in direct illumination. And this absolved the saints of this new church of the zero-sum contest in which their compatriots were increasingly locked between God's goodness and his communicativeness. Human pain needed no longer fill the prophetic office as actual human beings now played that role. And a strong commitment to personal revelations helped the saints find solace in their moments of calamity rather than looking to calamity itself for its own interpretation. Pain, the history of the early republic reminds us, is a biased interpreter of pain. Pain cannot accurately interpret itself. And the prophetic religion of the Restoration dramatically reduced the theological need for such a dead-end recourse. God would not primarily speak to us through such moments of immense pain, the Restoration declared. Instead, it was his will to talk us through the pain. Again, in my reading on the most effective response to those whose sense of pain puts their own lives at risk, the answer is again and again to keep the conversation going to avoid the lethal tendencies of self-isolating silence. When we talk about the restoration, we talk about God opening the heavens again, we often do not fully appreciate that one of the consequences, one of the lasting benefits of renewed revelation, was that we no longer needed to believe that he would speak only in the severities of our destruction. Pain became something other than God's last communicative recourse. Just as it is among humans, so in the relationship between heaven and earth, the openness of communication allows him to be present in our pain, rather than simply the executioner of it. Point number two that I'd like to make about the impact of the restoration has to do with our view of atonement, an atonement which puts empathic, the empathic project at its heart and center and shapes our understanding of God's relationship to pain. Traditional Christian doctrines, particularly in their reformed, or we might say Calvinistic expression, were increase, increasingly under threat in this period for many reasons, but most prominently for the ways in which they depicted the character of God. The Reformation's view of atonement, sometimes referred to as the penal substitution view, 
held that Christ actually took the place of sinners on the cross and endured the exact amount of pain and suffering to sate God's anger and offended sense of justice toward those, and only toward those, whom he had foreordained for salvation. As we move into the 19th century, more and more American Christians, including the so-called new divinity preachers who sought to keep a Jonathan Edwards form of Calvinism alive and relevant, they moved to a moral government view of atonement in which God had to make a demonstration of justice in order to uphold the dignity of his law and rule. In this version, he was less personally punishing Christ to vent his anger. He, rather, he was impersonally punishing Jesus to satisfy the demands of an abstract category of justice. Among the Unitarians who are emerging institutionally in this period, Christ's atonement lay not in vicarious suffering at all, but in the powerful message of love and conviction that a testator's martyrdom added to his testimony. Christian thought in the United States was evolving from a relatively monolithic one in which the father exhausted his anger through the pain of his embodied self, that is the pain he applied to the son, to the opening of other options, a fracturing of views of atonement, uh, in which, in the most liberal case, the Unitarian case, the morality of the father's infliction uh, of his pain was, uh, was not, in fact, the father's culpability at all, but Jesus' voluntary message of love on the cross. In these American evolutions and fracturings on atonement, the morality of the father's infliction of pain on his son lay at the heart of the debates. The mid-18th century preacher, whom I've already referenced, Jonathan Edwards, is often seen as a transitional figure from old reform doctrines to what we refer to as new divinity, representing a persistent Calvinist commitment and a new humanitarian ethos in the mid-18th century. But as every high school history student knows, he was also the preacher of a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's a little bit unfortunate that this is the way he's remembered for most of us since he actually spent the preponderance of his life trying to convey the beauty and goodness of God. But this is what he's remembered for, for good reason. In some ways, it's remarkable rhetoric. The, um, in this sermon, he depicted a God whose relationship to our pain would have been increasingly foreign to the antebellum era, in which his own new divinity acolytes, that is, those who followed after him, increasingly had to apologize for. Edwards wrote in this sermon, God will be so far from pitying you when you cry to him that tis said he will only laugh and mock you. If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case or showing you the least regard or favor that instead of that, he'll only tread you underfoot. And though he will know that you can't bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you, yet he won't regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy. He'll crush out your blood and make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments so as to stain all his remnant. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet, to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. Wow. <laughs> Edward's God persisted, but he would increasingly need to be justified in the coming decades. The God who took a certain delight in the pains of the wicked was losing traction in American culture. The empathic God was on the rise. In a poem that circulated through at least 13 newspapers in the late 18-teens and early 1820s, a rather profound point was buried in what was for the period typically saccharine verse. When gathering clouds around I view, and days are dark and friends are few, on him I lean who not in vain experienced every human pain. He feels my grief, allays my fears, and counts and treasures up my tears. Here we have, in poetic form, a doctrine of godly compassion. A God who experienced every human pain and feels our griefs. The, diff the Book of Mormon in some ways echoes but differs from such sentimentalized poetry. In the Restoration Scriptures, most notably in Alma 7, we have this poetic sentiment rendered in unmistakably prophetic prose. The poem does not beg for a, the poem does not beg for a God to remove pain, but rather looks for a God who can share it. The Book of Mormon answers that call. In doing so, it provides another witness of the God who is not only the source, but also someone with whom we might share our suffering. 
The Restoration provided a radical alternative to the theories of atonement and their implications for God's relationship to the pain of his children that were most prominent in the early republic. Right off the bat of the Restoration, in the pages of a Book of Mormon that had appeared mere weeks before the church was organized, we get a glimpse of a God who himself has to honor the principles of justice on which the universe depends. In Alma's exquisite rendering of the atonement and Lehi's illuminating teaching on Godhood, the atoning act is thus not the infliction of pain for the sake of slaking God's bloodthirst, and not merely to maintain the honor of a law that he created, and not even simply to send a symbolic message about his self-sacrificial love. It was an act of participation with us in a universe in which we all, the divine and the mortal alike, are subject to eternal laws, but in which the Godhead were willing to absorb most of that pain that we might only have the portion suited to our circumstance and growth. When Alma teaches that Christ took upon himself the pains and the sicknesses of his people that he might know, that beloved passage suggests that our redemptive relationship with him begins with an act of understanding. Empathy comes first. It has become something of a cliche among the therapeutic community that when pain is shared, its power is lessened. The doctrine of the restoration is that human pain is always shared, <coughs> divinely shared. The restoration thus offers a God who is not just the originator of pain, or perhaps not even the originator of pain, but a perfect, experienced companion in pain. Point number three is that the God who participates in the problem of, main, of pain does not do so in one transcendent act of atonement, but as a product of an eternal ontological role as father. As many of you undoubtedly know, one of the religious trends that was gaining steam in the decades preceding Joseph Smith's prophetic ministry was universalism. The idea that in the end all of God's children would be saved in his redeeming love. While universalism was often driven by an emotional impulse, there was a logic at its heart. Not only is it incompatible with mercy, they argued, that is the universalist, but it is irreconcilable with justice to avenge a finite sin with an infinite punishment. In many ways, this is an argument about calculations of pain. If I commit a murder, they held, the pain of that, ass, the pain of that act lasts momentarily for the person killed and perhaps for a lifetime for those who loved and depended on the victim. But not even that most immoral of acts seems comparable to the writhing in fires of hell for eternity that traditional Christianity promised. That is, they argued, there is nothing that a human can do in time to justify a punishment that never ends. The pains do not equate. And how can that comport with divine equity? Of course, the Calvinists had an answer for that, which is that it was not the act of murder that justified eternal damnation, but the unredeemed corruption of the heart from which the murderous thought proceeded that justified an eternity shut out from the holy courts of the Lord. But for anyone who believed that human works were at all related to salvation, which the Calvinists did not, but an increasing number of Americans did, the, universe, the Universalists had a bone to pick with the idea that any of those works would warrant never-ending punishment. And so this, deba this debate went, often with an energetic soul named John, Mur John, Mur John Murray at the center of the fray, a fellow who had recently immigrated to the United States from England and felt a call to disabuse Americans of the, their faith in eternal damnation and the mischaracterization of God that he believed it entailed. This John Murray is rather famous. In fact, he makes an appearance in Terrell Givens' Wrestling the Angel. He's often seen as the founding father of American universalism. There was another John Murray at the time, however, and I apologize, I tried to track down an image of him unsuccessfully. This John Murray was a Presbyterian immigrant to America from Ireland. In a, encountering this John Murray, and I realize we're, we're running, bumping up at the top of the hour, but if you'll forgive me just a quick uh, excursion here into a memory that I had forgotten for some time. Uh, the, the Irish John Murray reminds me of an experience my wife and I had uh, at, in the line at Costco some years ago, early in our, in our marriage. A woman in front of us, and my wife has this incredibly empathetic aura that she gives off, and lots of people begin to share lots of thoughts with us for no apparent reason. Uh, and that was happening on this particular occasion uh, in the line in Costco. A woman in front of us, my wife was expecting our daughter at the time, uh, with very little provocation, turned, noticed my wife was pregnant, and warned us to watch out for other children that share our children's names. They will torment your kids, she said. 
just for the sake of defending their own identity. And then she left with her groceries, which this being Costco included a three gallon jar of mustard and a 98 pack of paper towels. It was like something out of an Ingmar Bergman film. We didn't quite know how to make sense of it. Unfortunately, we had not lived to see her prophecy fulfilled. And I had not thought much of it since, but she came back to my mind when I recently read about this other John Murray, who seemed to have it out for this John Murray, who seemed to make it his life's mission to counteract and ultimately destroy the universalist message of his namesake. Could those who were swayed by this universalist heresy not see that without the threat of eternal damnation, the human race would have insufficient reason to maintain the basic human values on which society depended? Such a pain-free existence, the Irish, John Murray declared, would tear apart the foundations of humanity's shared existence. Nonsense, the English John Murray responded. When people realized that God was too, was too just and too good to eternally torment any of his children, their natural virtue would be stimulated rather than diminished. To keep these two John Murrays straight as they battled back and forth in the New American Republic, their contemporaries began to refer to the Universalist John Murray as Salvation Murray and his Calvinist ca counterpart as Damnation Murray. <laughs> The problem with Salvation Murray, said Damnation Murray, is that he did not appreciate the necessary power of pain. His pain-averse God, he said, was no less than a conspirator with the worst enemies of society, encouraging the murderers and thieves that he should be determined to crush. Such a God, Damnation Murray declared, possessed a feminine sort of goodness, which constrains him for his own happiness to keep all sinners from pain, and we must return and caress the offender whether he ceases rebellion or not. Close quote. The prospect of a God by his very, who by his very character would not or could, could not, sorry, the prospect of a God by his very character would not um, minimize his children's subjection to pain became an issue of recurrent concern in the universalist, anti-universalist debate that ran through the religious landscape of the restoration culture. Damnation Murray's characterization of the universalist God was in keeping with the binary rhetorical impulses of his time. There was a male kind of virtue that was strong and exacting, and a female kind of parenting that was soft and indulgent. His God was one half of that dualism, and Salvation Murray's God was the other, with little room for reconciliation between the two. This tendency to pit theological struggle as a battle of polarities was hardly unique in the early 19th century, but it certainly was a pronounced propensity in the religious controversies of the era. Some have accused the Book of Mormon of reflecting this kind of polemic. But the evidence of the Book of, book, book, of, the book of Mormon on the question of universalism is actually rather ambiguous. And the revelations that were received in the 19th century paint a similarly complex picture, though on a somewhat different key. Unafraid of complexity and even contrariety, the Restoration Scriptures reject damnation Murray's stark biformities. A God who both aches to redeem and upholds truth and justice cannot be reduced to either side of his character when reading the restored scriptures as a whole. Their content, when taken in their totality, suggests both a God who has provided for the recovery of the vast majority of his children, indeed virtually all of the earth's inhabitants in some form of salvation, while still reminding us of the reality of eternal suffering, reminding us of it primarily, as Fiona and Terrell have taught so well, by exemplifying it. God may wipe all tears from our eyes, according to Revelation 21.4, but they remain in his, according to Moses 7. Our God, our scriptures teach, hurts with us, indeed hurts beyond us, not in some token metaphorical sense, not as a gesture or as a brief taste, but he hurts with us from before our pain began to well after ours has been resolved. After he dries our eyes, his continue to weep. He demonstrates in the process that pain may be the price we pay for love, and thus pain continues even in the loving courts above. But it is something that he uses to bring us together, rather than, as we so often allow pain to do, drive us apart. Again and again, when I look at the religious culture of the Restoration era and compare it to the doctrines of the restored gospel, the conclusion that jumps out to me from the contrast is that pain is not so much something that God does to us, but something that he experiences with us, something he can talk us through as a God of revelation, something that he can relate to as a God whose atoning plan put empathy at its center, that he can redirect and reframe, and at times in his wisdom and strength even rebuke 
participating in such a way that the effects of pain might be rendered redemptive to the extent that we allow him to walk with us. This is for me the most important answer to the paradox of pain. It does not resolve its competing terms. The question is not really can pain be good for us or should we seek to heal? Those are always unavoidably yes, however contradictory they may seem to each other. The question rather is a much more daunting one. It is do we suffer alone? And the restoration answers that with a resounding no. Which brings me to my final point, point number four is in some sense a reflection on the other three and a recognition, recognition that for whatever else the restoration did, it created a remarkable community. I spend my professional life studying and admiring and often appropriating the principles and truths that I find in other faith traditions, including the kinds of combatants that I've been quoting here tonight. But I have to say that in that search and professional investigation, I have found nobody that does community like the Latter-day Saints. And it is there in a community that at its best replicates the communicative, participatory, and empathic approach of our Father to pain that we find one of the most essential resources for living with this paradox that we will never fully resolve. In this problem of pain and in its implications for our relationship with our Father in heaven, it is worth pausing to reflect on its lessons for our interactions with each other. If God's approach to our pain is to understand it, to recognize it, and to walk with us as we shoulder it, perhaps we should do something of the same for those hurting around us. He sought to understand our pain at the heart of the atonement before he sought to heal it. He sought to understand it before he sought to teach. So perhaps we should seek the comprehending of the suffering of others before we answer them, our, before we offer them our answers. And he reminds us that we need to remain present, doggedly, persistently, enduringly, in each other's pain. I'll conclude with one anecdote from my ecclesiastical life. I was meeting with a man a couple of years ago who was in a very difficult circumstance. And his life had been informed by the mental illnesses of those around him. He himself was battling in a situation to keep a family together. He had grown up with a mother who suffered from a bipolar condition and made life in their home exceedingly difficult. And his wife had just been diagnosed with a mental illness um, as they were raising these four children. And as I sat with this brother and we talked about the terms of uh, his circumstance, I asked him what his church community had done or failed to do or could do for him. And he said something that sort of seared into my memory. He said, you know, we had a recurring cycle of well-meaning priesthood leaders and others who would come into our home determined to solve our problems and would work diligently for a week or two or a month or two, and then when they realized that our problems were not going away, that they would not be resolved that quickly, if at all. We lost sight of them and connection with them. So we really didn't need somebody to resolve our problem we needed someone to walk that road with us. That, I think, is what God has pledged to do in the restoration. And that, I think, is what he asks of us for each other. Thus, perhaps, of all the resources the restoration offers us for dealing with the problem of pain, among the most important is the community that comes with the kingdom, a place where our suffering can be shared and in the sharing be rendered redemptive. One of the reasons the pioneer story resonates so strongly with us is that it is a story of shared pain and an exhibit, exhibit A, of what the community of saints can see themselves through when we take seriously the charge to mourn with those that mourn. I cannot convey to you the depth of my gratitude for such a community, perhaps especially for one that comes again out of an early 19th century context where a new ethos of individual rights and the new imperatives of a market of economy began to make such communities even more unlikely. And I'm grateful for the fact that this same community has encouraged me in my intellectual life, in my particular case, the study of history. One of the reasons I have come to see my academic work as a historian as sacred is that it enables, even forces me to understand the historic pains that those around me carry. William Faulkner once famously said, 
of life in the South. The past is not dead. In fact, it's not even past. Sometimes academic historians get criticized for telling history as if it were one long train of abuses and miseries. Certainly it wasn't that. Life is always more complex than that. There is much, much to celebrate and value. But like a sorrowing soul that carries the wounds of their youth, wounds that make even the most basic of relationships nearly impossible now, so our world is full of communities that carry such historic pain. If we are to work to heal this world, which is what I understand to be the disciples' task and the Lord's call in the restoration of his kingdom, we need to be serious about understanding this world's wounds. God himself, the God of the restoration, set our example for such a thing. Of that I have a witness, and offer that to you this evening in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.